Amen. So let's look at God's word this morning. You know, if you think about it, love, that four letter word, we do the craziest things for love. The absolute most ridiculous and wild things in the name of love. How many of y'all parents came to the United States from mainland Korea? Excellent. Put your hands down. Why? Well, they will tell us that it's so that we could have a better life. In the name of love, they left behind their home, country, and family and worked to start a new one for the sake of love. For the sake of love, guys will put on elaborate proposal presentations in an attempt to woo the woman of their dreams. In the name of love, a couple will spend ridiculous amounts of money planning the wedding that the bride has always desired. If we look throughout history, wars have been waged in the name of love. Lives born, lives surrendered, thrones abdicated. So many crazy things have happened for love. Think about yourself when you feel like you're in love with someone. You think you can pick up the world in your hand and toss it around like a basketball. You would do anything anything. You know, <laughs> our church service starts at 11 o'clock. That's not that early. You guys wake up at like five to go to school. But sometimes, not sometimes, if you guys look at the beginning of service and at the end of service, the amount of people in the room has dramatically increased because people are late. But you know what? If you were on, if you had a date at 11 o'clock with the love of your life, you wouldn't be late. Why? Because it's in the name of love. In the name of love, you're willing to bypass your procrastinating, lazy nature and do something beyond. In the name of love, we will dress a certain way. We will try to look a certain way or act a certain way. There was this girl that I once liked before I um, married my wife and she made this passing comment that she liked guys whose cartilage was pierced with that that rod I almost did it <laughs> I almost did it because she said that she liked that I was about to as a dude go to a place and say stick two needles in here and then stick a metal rod in there because this girl told me that she likes that for many of us, in the name of trying to receive the love of our parents, we will excel and exceed our limitations in order to find their approval. We push ourselves so hard, trying to be the best at everything that we do, hoping that if we did our best, our parents would look at us and say, well done, you have my approval. Why do we do that? It's in the name of love. But the opposite is also true. Many of us, we will act out in rebellion for the sake of attention that cries, I just want to be heard. I want to be known for who I am. And I want to be loved. We'll surrender our minds, our bodies, our hearts for the sake of trying to find meaningful relationships with people. We will cross boundaries that we know we should not cross in the name of finding love. In the name of love, all manner of foolish things have occurred. But also, in the name of love, beautiful and incredible things have occurred. We talked about this yesterday, that every act and every event in your life that has occurred has a purpose. There is a meaning behind it, that even the longings and the frustrations that you 
feel are a reflection of a greater reality. That the longings that you have, and that, brothers and sisters, includes love, exist to point you to a deeper understanding of what love really is. It's pointing towards something, both the good and the bad. And like we concluded yesterday, the thing that we are looking for is not the temporary, but we are looking for eternity. But this morning, I want to look at it the other way around. To know that we can start looking for eternity because eternity has first come down looking for us. And what I mean by that is any notion, longing, yearning, or desire that you have had or currently experiencing to know God, it is a sign that God has first started the conversation with you. Not a single one of us has loved God first. Not a single one of us has ever approached God first. He has initiated the relationship. Brothers and sisters, when you take a step towards God, you must recognize that He has taken an infinite amount of steps towards you first. Before you even know how to look for Him, He has come looking for you. And we see that so clearly in John's gospel. John, the other gospel writers, they start with Jesus' birth. They go through the whole tale, but John, he gets right to the point. He says that in the beginning was the Word. Can we say Word? In the beginning was the Word. Well, if you look at Genesis 1, we see in the beginning, what was, who was there? God. And John says in the beginning was the Word. This isn't a contradiction. This is a perfect alignment. But what is the Word? The word in Greek, it comes from a word called logos. Can we say logos? And what does that mean? It means perfect, eternal, complete. The word is truth. A truth that sets reality as it is. Is. And if you think about the nature of truth and lies, that makes sense. When you say a lie, what you're painting is a certain reality. Like, hey guys, I have a tiger. Now you have this image of Pastor Stephen walking his tiger down morning view, right? But what does the truth do? If you come over and you realize, I don't have a tiger, I have a potato of a dog named Sammy, all of a sudden it shapes reality as it is supposed to to be as it's supposed to be this truth is above everything in our scope and plane the word this truth is unblemished and it is unrivaled that is the essence of what truth is it's untouchable it is unshakable it is the truth and we are told that in the beginning was this truth this word but why is that important it's important because we as people in the present state that we are in and we'll talk about that more in a second we are people who are in desperate need of the truth we are in desperate need of the truth Far too long have so many of us been building up our lives on a lie. Far too often we have soaked in the lies of this world and the lies of what cult, the culture around us promotes, the lies of what it tells us value and worth are. We are in desperate need of the truth. And it is clear from yesterday's text that everything on earth has an expiration date. Amen? That means that there's nothing on this earth that can truly help you, truly encourage you, truly restore you. And there is nothing on this earth that can save you and bring you out of this present state. Created things cannot save created things. 
What the Bible will tell us time and time again is that if you want to get out of the place that you are in, help cannot come from this plane, but it needs to come from above. Only when a being from above our reality, our understanding, our limitations, only such a being could break through and save us from where we are. But what is this present state that we find ourselves in? Last night, we looked at a little bit of our reactionary state. That we're on this line of time, we're just reacting to what happens next. And that is exhausting. But there's more to it than that. Paul tells us in the book of Romans that we, our our flesh itself is entangled, it's intertwined in this state of sin. And the state of sin is the state of darkness that we dwell in. And if you really take a moment right now, and you think about your life, all of the layers, your outer layers, and then the inner layers, and on and on and on. If you think about your masks, the one that you put on for church, the one that you put on for your family, the one that you put on for your friends, the one you put on on Discord, the one you put on on Snapchat, the one you put on on Instagram, the one you put on your private Snapchat, the one you put on your private Instagram, and you start breaking all those things down, If you think about your thoughts, your simple thoughts, just the ones that pop into your head, but you look a little deeper at some of your darker thoughts, your terrible thoughts, your thoughts of hatred, your thoughts of evil, your thoughts of self-hate, you start to realize something in me is not quite right. We are anxious, foolish Silly, temperamental, wretched beings, are we not? You ever look to the very core of who you are and just ask yourself, why does anyone love me? Do you ever look at the mess that you made a particular day and say, how could anyone possibly love me? I'm not even sure I love myself. How could, and and I kind of know who I am. If someone were to see this, how could they love me? And the cry behind that statement is a cry that is saying, I am lost and I am hoping to be found. But in our hopes to be found, more often than not, we find ourselves to be fearful. Fearful of what? Fearful of the fact that if someone found out who we really were, they would reject us, they wouldn't understand us, they might even mock us, they might even hurt us with what they have discovered. And why do we think like this? I think in many ways, deep down, we know that we, we feel that we are undeserving of a true affection to be known and to be loved. And that is a state of darkness, brothers and sisters. It is a state of darkness that tells you that no one can understand you. No one can truly know you. No one can get to you. No one can relate to you. And I think a lot of times when we feel that way, we also feel that our God is not an active and present one, but he is a distant one because in our weaknesses failures inabilities hurts doubts pains in the state of wretchedness we say well if God is perfect if he is above everything then how can a perfect God care about me how could he care about me If he's so above, if he's so righteous, how could he care about the state that I am in? So more often than not, in our depravity, we don't run towards God, but we run away from him. When you're a kid and you make a mistake, do you run towards your parents? As you get a little older, you start running away from them. You try to hide it. You try to cover it. I don't know if your mom's like this, but my mom, she has a lot of glass ornaments, like the Swarovski, Swarovski crystals, yes. She's been collecting those for quite some time, and now that my brother's gotten older, he buys her these crystals. But when I was a kid, she had a dolphin one, 
And I was goofing on on the bed and I knocked it over and I broke the dolphin in half. You know what I did? I took some scotch tape. And I taped that sucker right back up. Why? Because in my foolish mistake, I didn't want to run to her. I wanted to run away from her. And in that place where we are running away from God, in the state of darkness where we are running away from him, we try to fulfill ourselves and our lives with very insufficient things. Things that don't get us out of a state of darkness, but things that make it feel like it is okay to be in a state of darkness. Things that don't get us out of the situation, but help to mask the situation that we are in. And I'll give you some examples. Anyone broke? Anyone broke in here? You're just like, dude, I got nothing. I got like two cents to my name. Yeah. Like you ever like go to the dollar menu and it's too expensive? You're like, dude, I don't think I can swing this today. And you see that little charity box, and you're like, dude, I think that's for me. Like, do I just take the money from here because I'm in need? You ever feel that way? You know, when you're broke, it's really easy to hang around people who are also broke. Right? (laughs) Sarah knows. Right? Because what? You're sharing in the suffering. You're sharing in the suffering. You know what it's like. They know what it's like. It's really easy to relate. And if you're broke and you're around people who are not broke, it's pretty uncomfortable. In fact, it can be awkward when you have friends who aren't broke and you try to hang out because they're like, oh, let's watch a movie. And you're like, that's my life savings. I don't know if I can swing that today. Like, let's go to Chipotle. You're like, dude, $8 for a burrito? I don't know, Quick Trip has burritos. You just microwave those bad boys. It's awkward. You feel like they can't relate to you. So what do you do? You try to go find broke friends. You try to find broke friends. When I was in high school, my parents moved us to the nicer part of the suburbs of Chicago. Very nice town. It's called Naperville. Like that just sounds rich, doesn't it? Naperville. But we are not a rich family. My first car was an Oldsmobile Alero. Have you heard of it? They went bankrupt before most of you were born, all right? An Oldsmobile Alero. And but all these kids in my school, they got the nice 5 Series BMWs. They got their Audis. They got their Mercedes. So nice. They got the Lexus. Dude, if you drive a Lexus, God loves you so much. Like, that's just a nice machine, right? It's a nice machine. But I would never want to hang around them. If I went to one of their house, they would just be all lined up, these nice cars, and then my dinky Oldsmobile Alero <laughs> just tug it along and just pull it up right beside them. I have every fluid in the world in the trunk because this bad boy would break down at any given moment. So I didn't want to hang out with them. Why? Because I felt that they couldn't relate. They couldn't get me. So I would rather be with people who were broke than people who were rich. The same goes with other things, though. The broke thing's funny, but there's deeper things like anxiety. You know, if you're a person that struggles with anxiety, it's really easy just to hang around people who struggle with anxiety. Why? Because they get it. Because they get it. In fact, we will so often complain when we're around those who don't share that struggle because we say that they don't understand. No one understands. The same goes for those of us wrestling with depression. It's easier to hang out with people who struggle with depression. Why? Because other people don't understand. The same goes with guilt, shame, self-harm, parental and familial struggles. We try to find people who get us. And these are not bad things, brothers and sisters. It's good to have people who relate to you. It's good to have people in your life that are struggling with the same things that you are. It's not a bad thing. But the truth of the matter is, if that's all you have, if that's all you have in this life, then you are on a road to nowhere. Why? Because broken things, brothers and sisters, broken things cannot fix broken things. Amen? Broken things can't fix broken things. They might make you feel better for a moment, even a long moment. But what plagues you will continue to do so. What haunts you will continue to do so. Eventually, the reality will set in. That there is nothing on this earth and there is no human being on this earth that can make you whole in the way that you need to be restored. Why? 
Because all people, all of us, in our state of sin, are in a state of darkness. And we simply do not know the way out. It is the blind leading the blind. When I first moved to that part of town, uh, my friend came and... Um, when we first moved, I was like a sophomore. So the year before I started driving. And he came and uh, he wanted to go to a PC bang. You guys know what PC bangs are? Yeah, internet cafes, as they say in America. Um, but it was really far. It was like, like a 20, 30 minute drive. But we had our bicycle, so we said, let's bike there. We biked there. It took like an hour or two. And then, you know, we played a um, Counter Strike 1.5. Why are you laughing? It's a classic. Counter-Strike 1.5, we played for a little bit, and then we left. But this is a new part of town for for me and for him, and so we got lost. We got lost, guys. And we got lost because I was following him, and he was following nothing. And so we're leading each other to this random part of town. And we went to this shady gas station, and we bought an RC Cola, because we spent, do you guys know what RC Cola is? It's off, it's like, it's like cheap Coke. Yeah, like cheap Coca-Cola. Drank that to hydrate ourselves. And then we biked even more and more and more. Eventually, we were so lost. We had to ask someone for help. We didn't have GPS back in the day on our phone, so we looked at a map. And we were shocked at how far we were from home. It took about three to four hours to bike back home because we were so lost. But oftentimes, if all you have is people to relate to in that state of being lost, then what you'll find yourself is being very lost. And why does this happen? Because it's the nature of sin, brothers and sisters. The nature of this darkness leaves us blind. Let's look to Adam and Eve. When sin entered, what did it do to their direction? Before they had this perfect intimacy with God, Adam walked with God. Perfect intimacy. He knew who God was and he knew who he was. Adam and Eve had the greatest marriage of all time. But when sin entered, what did it do? It started to fracture. All of a sudden, their direction was unknown. And even their relationship began to crack. So rather than being able to uplift one another out of this state of temptation, they spiraled down towards it. And they were cast out of the garden They were unable to make their way back. Whereas Adam once walked with God, he was no no longer able to do so. And that is a state of spiritual darkness. Because if being in the presence of our God is the source of our hope and our security, then being away from his presence must be the source of our stress and anxiety. Do you see what I'm saying? If being with God is security, then being away from God must be insecurity. And many of us have experienced this, and many of us are still experiencing it to this day, this state of darkness. But the state of darkness, it will also remove, try to remove from us the desire to know God. Instead of running towards him, we will want to be far from him, to disobey him, to ignore him, to not understand ourselves in the light of who he is. It is a terrible cycle. And many of us in the state of darkness, we have given up. We've looked around and said, man, maybe this is all there is. Maybe this is just my life and I need to learn how to deal with it. Maybe I do have to measure my worth based on what the world says. Maybe I am not good enough. Maybe I am unworthy. Maybe this is too much to handle and I should press the escape button a little early. But you know what? When you start misplacing these priorities in your life, that's when you start to get really lost and confused. What I mean by that is this. What you and I need the most is the truth. Can we say truth? The truth of being in God's presence. That's what we need to seek first. But when we are out of his presence, we don't want to go to him. We want to keep doing what we want to do. All of a sudden, the priorities are out of whack. 
You know, one time I was, um, I was talking to a, a youth student and they're going through a time of struggle. And they felt that God was really far from them and they, didn't, they weren't sure if they really believed in God anymore. And I was just talking to them about their lives and just kind of what they fill their mind with and what they fill their heart with. Does anyone ever ask you that? What do you do during the week? And what do you respond with? School. And like, after that, what? Nothing. Sometimes I ask my brother-in-law that when I pick him up. Like, what'd you do in school today? Nothing. Oh, that's cool. What are you gonna do when you go home? Discord. Yeah, it's very descriptive. But as I was talking to this young man, I, I realized that his mind was just littered. It was littered and filled in a state of darkness and in a state of junk. His consumption rate was so high. Every time temptation came his way, he was like, nom, 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 nom. He just ate it up and he filled his heart. And that heart was so full. He had no, no inclination. There was no room for God anymore. And I think that's what happens in this crazy state of darkness. It wants you to stay right there it does not want you to get out when you succumb to sin you're enabling darkness to cover you and when darkness covers you it wants to drown you it doesn't want you to get out it wants to tell you that it's going to be okay it doesn't want you to be free it tries to convince you that this new form of slavery is the way that it's supposed to be it doesn't want you to experience the truth it tells you that the truth can't relate to you it doesn't understand who you are it blinds you from reality it wants you to stay in that pit and many times when we're in a place like this what we end up experiencing the most is just hating ourselves self-hate we struggle with this guilt and with this shame now what is guilt and shame I know I always make fun of that statement you can't shame me um, that this generation likes to say so much but I do want to clarify the terms but as we kind of get into this middle portion you guys still with me look at me don't leave don't leave me behind don't leave me in the wilderness you guys still with me yes. all right thank you guilt in its essence is like a legal term guilt is when you have a moral standard and you fall short of it but shame has more to do with how you see yourself and how you fall short of a standard that you have made for yourself. And what I mean by that is what most modern psychologists will point to this idea of self-ideal. Can we say self-ideal? What is self-ideal? Self-ideal is an image that you have of yourself, like this perfect version of you. And we all have one. Maybe your self-ideal is that like you're a really disciplined, hardworking person. But the reality is, you're actually a procrastinating dingus. So when you procrastinate, you are going to experience shame because it doesn't match with the self-ideal that you have. If you imagine yourself to be a good person, to be a strong believer, but the reality is, you got some sins in your heart that haven't been worked out. Well, when you succumb to those sins, you don't get your experience? Shame. Because it doesn't match with your self-ideal. For those of you who like to procrastinate, and you say, wow, I have five hours left. I can do this assignment in three. And it doesn't work out? What do you feel afterwards? This weird guilt and shame, like a failure. <laughs> this total moral mess. And that's this place of darkness that we can find ourselves in. Where this self-ideal, these misplaced priorities, they point to just a misplacement, a misalignment about who we are. And it's nearly impossible to get out of, of this place. A lot of times in this place of self-hate and darkness, we could also become very angry people. We get angry with ourselves because of our failure. And our anger can lead to abuse, 
You say, because I am worthless, because I am ugly, because I am guilty, because I am dirty, I will hurt myself, I will be down on myself, because I am unlovable, I will kick myself when I'm down, I will make, I will say things to myself that will make me feel a whole lot worse, because I deserve this, because I am guilty. And then you really start hating yourself and you let other people abuse you. You let other people take advantage of you. Because when you hate yourself, you start to view yourself as cheap and you let others treat you cheaply. You stop taking care of yourself. Are any of you sad eaters? Like when you're sad, you eat? Yeah, yeah. What happens? You go to Walmart and you're like, I'll buy an ice cream. Oh, they only have it in large? Oh, well, I'll take a couple bites. Take a couple of bites, and like, huh? You keep eating and eating and eating, and it's gone. It's gone. When I'm in a bad mood, I go buy a piece of pizza bites. You know what I'm talking about? And I always buy the really big bag because I'm like, there's no way I'll eat this in one sitting. But then I'm sad, so I eat and I eat and I eat and I eat and I eat, and all of a sudden, I'm like, I need to throw this bag away before my wife finds it. What is this? It's this cycle of we can't get out of it. And we try to cover ourselves up to the best of our ability to keep it in the dark, to keep it quiet, to not tell anyone, and just try to live our lives with the problem continues to persist. What I'm trying to say, guys, is that in a state of darkness, it's impossible to break out of the cycle. Because when we try, we will fail. And when we fail, we'll experience more guilt and shame. And because we experience more guilt and shame, we'll just hate ourselves all the more for it. So instead of looking for a way out, we just want relatability. We just want acceptance. We want people to relate to our struggles and nothing more because it is comfortable. It's comfortable. If you like getting high, it's just nice to find people who like getting high and just leaving it at that. End of story. If you like goofing off all day, it's just nice to find other people who goof off all day and just relate to it. And end of story. We just want to be accepted for the place that we are in and nothing more. And then we start to really give up. There are times, brothers and sisters, when the reality of life hits us time and time again and you just want to stop trying. Why does this happen? It's because comfort alone, acceptance alone, and relatability alone cannot save us. But what does then? Our Lord tells us that it is the truth that sets us free. Can we say truth? This is why a man named C.S. Lewis, he says this, if you look for truth, if you look for truth, you may find comfort in the end. But if you look for comfort, you will get neither comfort or truth, only soft soap and wishful thinking to begin, and in the end, despair. What What Lewis is saying is that if you look for truth, you may find some comfort. But if all you ever try to find in your life is comfort, you'll only be left with despair. So how do we get out of the place that we are in? We need truth. And the truth is the word. Can we say the word? This is why the psalmist says, your word is a lamp unto my feet. God's word tells us that the truth that we need was there from the beginning. It is from above. What does that mean for us then? It means that the truth that we need to set us free from the place that we are in is the truth of who God is, his love for us, evidenced by his son. Now I want you to look at your Bibles real quick. And we're going to go back to John 1 and we're going to scroll to verse 14. Verse 14. And let's read it together. One, two, three. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. It tells us that this word that was there from the beginning came down and dwelt among us. Now, a better word for this word dwelt is tabernacled. Can we say tabernacled? And an even better word for tabernacle for our modern vernacular is temple. Can we say temple? What John is saying is this word that has been there from the beginning has come down and templed among us. 
Now, if you've been with us during our Wednesday Bible study, you know how important temples are to the Bible. Amen? In a temple, what do you find? It was a whole semester. (laughs) And in the Holy of Holies, Janice, whose presence is in there? The presence of God. But who can enter into the Holy of Holies and be in the presence of God and be in that presence of that security? The high priest. Can he go every day? How many times a year can he go? And what is that day called? Who said the Sabbath? (laughs) On the Day of Atonement. Does that sound familiar now? All right. All right, come back, come back, come back. So in the temple that Solomon built, the very center place was called the Holy of Holies. And this is where God dwelt. This is where his presence was on earth, this very secluded space. And only the high priest could go there once a year. And we've talked about this before. Oftentimes the high priest would have a rope and a what? A bell. Just in case he done goofed in the Holy of Holies, what would happen? He'd die and they have to drag him out. Do you see how exclusive that is? The rest of the nation could not be in God's presence. Only one man, once a year, under very specific circumstances, could be in the presence of the light of God. Could you imagine if that was the case in your life and you could only meet God once a year? Some of you are like, I only meet him twice a year when I go on retreats. (laughs) But could you imagine if that was it? But now John comes along and he says, the word became flesh and templed among us. That Jesus came down, took the form of a man, and he templed among the people. That means that everywhere Jesus goes, what what is he carrying with him? He is God himself. It's the presence of God everywhere. It means that whereas once man was once cut off, God has now opened the doorway. And everywhere he travels, the presence of God is meeting people. The world that had been in a state of darkness, all of a sudden, light from above came crashing down and shattering the dark. And this is no small thing. This is no light thing. This isn't a Sunday school lesson that we can just forget and push behind. This is the incarnation of our Lord, that God came in the flesh. And this is a wild, wild thought. Now, oftentimes when we think about Jesus, we all have a mental image of Jesus in our mind. And um, PB shared this, I think, in Reacts the other day. And and I want to share with you guys because I I think it's pretty effective. Um, Can we show the first picture of Jesus, son? Ah, yes. How many of you, when you think about Jesus, you see someone like this? Right? And you're like, God came in the flesh and has become a beautiful hipster. (laughs) He probably brews coffee, wears a fanny pack, got a couple tattoos, right? And you're like, well, that's nice. (laughs) I mean, you know, this guy's walking around town. Like, that's not too bad. God came in the flesh and became that? Not too shabby. Some of you guys are like, I wish I looked like that. It's a a handsome fella up there, right? And that is often the, um, the, the picture of Jesus that we have. This white dude with the beard, green eyes, and like a man who's conditioned his hair. <laughs> like he uses conditioner, this guy, doesn't he? He uses conditioner. Yeah. 
But if we understand our geography and our history correctly, the chances that Jesus looked like this are slim to none. This is some white dude. Jesus was a Jew. <laughs> See what I'm saying? See what I'm saying? Yeah? That means, and so there's this uh, historian, geologist, something. Um, he, he, he put together this image, and he's, not, he, he's like, this isn't Jesus. But he says, this is what the average man from this region during this time most likely looked like. What he most likely looked like. This is not Jesus. And I honestly, I don't care for images of Jesus because we don't know what he looked like. But the word also tells us that Jesus had no features that were attractive to us. Just an average dude. Just an average guy. There was nothing about his physical features that you would find to be beautiful. And so this man, um, he, you know, based on a skull around that time and around that region, he kind of put together a composite. And this is what he came up with. Can we show the next one? And, 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 it's, and as, hey, as, 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 gig, as giggly as, as you might feel, it's entirely possible that Jesus looked a lot more like this man than the man that you saw, bef than the man that you saw before. That Jesus most likely did not walk this earth with perfectly conditioned hair and a perfectly groomed beard, but he most more than the other man, probably looked more like this man. Now, brothers and sisters, let's say this is even remotely true. I'm not saying that's what Jesus looked like. Well, let's say it was something like that. God came in the flesh. In the flesh. This is no light matter. This is no light thing. This isn't something that's so just trivial that we can just look and laugh. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. What does that tell us? It tells us that God coming down in the flesh he did that so that you can know, that I can know, that we have a God who understands. He knows what it means to be a human being. We have a God who relates. It tells us that we have a God who relates to us and wants to have a meaningful intimate relationship with us. And that is possible because he knows what it is to be one of us. Brothers and sisters, for those of you who are struggling, for those of you who have been weeping, for those of you who have experienced loss and the pain that comes with loss, the word became flesh and dwelt among what does that tell you? It tells you that your pain and your loss, your weeping and your sorrow are not far from him. It is not very hard for Jesus to understand what pain is all about. This is why the book of Hebrews tells us that our great high priest, can we say great high priest? is a sympathetic high priest. He sees you where you are and he says, I know. He says, I know. For those of us who feel that we have this, we have a God and his perfection, he sees us in our darkness and doesn't want anything to do with us. For those of you who feel like you have a God that doesn't understand, that you have no one in your life that can truly understand, I ask this morning to look at the incarnation of Christ and see that you have a God that understands. Brothers and sisters, those who feel that the weight of temptation is way too much to bear, that you guys, you got some things that you've been addicted to for way too long, and it's so hard to get out of it. It seems nearly impossible. Look to our Lord, who he himself was tempted in the wilderness. He knows what that is like. For those of us who feel like we have been betrayed by the people closest to us and there is no way we can trust anyone ever again, look 
to Jesus, who was betrayed by all of his friends. Even the very people who confessed that he was Lord, Peter himself said, you will, I'm never going to let you die. And in that moment, Peter said three times, I don't even know who that man is. That on the cross, his best friends abandoned him in the moment where he suffered the most. Those of you who are still stuck being hurt by betrayal, your Lord knows what it means to be betrayed. For our God was betrayed by a kiss. For those of us who are struggling and have struggled with anxiety, look to our Lord. Look at his struggle in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he was so anxious over what was going to happen next. It left him sweating blood, pleading with the Father to let this cup pass from him. What I want to convey to us this morning is that the Word became flesh, and that means that when we look at Jesus, we see our God who has come down for us, who has become a man and says, says to us, I understand what it means to be human. And he comes, he came down and said, I have come looking for you. This presence of God that was only accessible to a few under very specific conditions has been now been made available to those who call, believe, and confess in his name. But why? Why would God do this? Because brothers and sisters, the craziest things in the world that have ever been done, have been done in the name of love. And in the name of God's love for you, his son came down for you. You have a God who understands. You have a God who relates. But so much more than that. Because not only was our Lord human, he was the perfect human. The perfect Adam. He did what we could not. He lived the life that we could not. And he died the death that we should have died. Our Lord has not only experienced what you are experiencing, but he has overcome. Amen? Amen. Jesus has not only experienced what you are experiencing and have, but he has overcome. Amen, Ethan. I love you, man. And for all of his struggles, for everything that happens, when we look to Jesus, we not only see someone who relates to us, but we see someone who has conquered. This is why we are told that our Lord has overcome the world. What is that? That's eternity looking for you, looking for you, saying, come follow me. Come and follow me because all these other things in your life, they're just going to leave you in that cycle of darkness. You can't get out. You need more than relatability. You need more than just relational understanding. I offer those things and so much more in the manner that you really need it, but I can also, I will lift you out of this place. So how do we get there? How do we get there? Well, here's some practical things, and then we'll close. Number one, if this word is light for our present darkness, then you need to invite the light in. You need to look at areas of your life that are filled with doubts, hurts, worries, and pains, and invite light to come in so that you see what is truly happening. But for many of us, light shining on that area is going to be very uncomfortable because there are parts of our hearts that have been locked up in the dark for so long. Shining the light on it will not be pleasant, but it will be good. We need to go to him. And what I mean by go to him, what I mean by invite 
is surrender. Can we say surrender? It is surrendering our hearts over to our God who understands. It is surrendering our doubt to our God who understands. It's speaking to your heart, speaking to your God, because you know he knows your struggle. And so that's what I would like for us to do right now. Just to have a moment of prayer. And don't pray like you have a God that doesn't understand you. Don't pray like you have a God that doesn't, doesn't want to have a relationship with you. But let us earnestly come before him knowing that he knows and he loves and he is in hot pursuit after your heart.